Ahoy hoy, and welcome to episode 5 of the Elven Room Podcast with me Frank Shortle and his likes include Jurassic Park, Crowded House and Pints. His dislikes include people who don't like Jurassic Park, Crowded House and Pints. It's Shane Martin. All of that was really factual. That was really good. That's a way better intro you gave me than the last time, so I'm really happy now. <laughs> I, I'm just here to build upon my, my own work. And I'm also joined by a man whose likes include the history of the Boyne Valley, Irish geography, paradiddles, and lo-fi bedroom pop. His dislikes include Jim Morrison and other such posers. It's Ian Hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Frank, what are your likes and dislikes? Comparing people's likes and dislikes and uh, introducing podcasts. I was going to say. Um, you... My dislikes are uh, the awkwardness after you introduce the podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um yeah we've we've got a an action-packed show this week i interviewed a very very good musician who i'm very excited about from this year it is new york based lo-fi dream bedroom pop slacker extraordinaire jw francis who joined me from brooklyn where he currently resides we have that for you midway through our show in a little bit but i'd like to start off the show during my conversation with jw francis we spoke a lot about places and cities and how they have an effect on your writing style or just the music that comes from certain areas and that kind of got me thinking about how does the place that a music comes from shape the music kind of contemporarily in the crazy internet world where everything is globalized and like what's kind of the history of it in terms of why does certain music from certain parts of the world sound the way it is um but it's something that has just always kind of fascinated me what do you guys think yeah absolutely uh, there's certainly history to tell there um i think it uh the, the work of um 19th century geographer lisa Riclu comes to mind he's, he's one of my absolute favorites in uh back in college um so basically aside from the the standard school of geography you know the physical geography and that he was a pioneer in the kind of social end and in particular how place affected the actual human condition you know like a, a social ecology or like a cultural ecology nearly how uh, where you live, the land itself, what you do day to day affects, inextricably affects, is linked to, you know, how you go about your your life, be it your entertainment or whatever. And very interesting part of it was um, he touched on music. Um, now, he didn't do it in every single place he looked at, but uh, just a few excellent examples. Um, so he, got, he spent a lot of time in Louisiana uh, mm-hmm. in the kind of 1850s, 1860s, nearly around the Civil War, just before the Civil War. And... Um, he noticed that a lot of the uh, slaves, you know, the, 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 you know, they work the land, you know, they're on their, their uh, cotton plantations and that. And obviously the work is, in, you know, it's incredibly mundane, it's backbreaking. And the only thing that uh, he noticed that really kept their spirits going was singing, you know, uh, singing along these very rhythmic things that he said they weren't necessarily melodic, you know, but they were very rhythmic, you know, they had a real rhythm to them and a pattern. And uh, they, he said, you could see it, you could observe it as they were picking the cotton, you know, like uh, they were singing these chants. Um, now, he didn't really coin anything at the time. He didn't say, oh, this is blues or anything like that, you know, this is way before then. But you can see how, you know, their situation there, like um, ba- basically what he was trying to extrapolate was back then before pre-mechanization, you know, this was a very mundane task for humans, you know, to work the land, to work arable land, basically. And to get through that, you know, they had this, outlet of music you know to sing along to um and another example that he looks at um it's, it's quite curious so i don't know why he really highlighted it but uh georgia um yeah. so you know way over in the caucasus like you know uh, near russia and apparently very same thing um now he actually does highlight that it's a, it's a bit of a different situation there like there weren't slaves and um, they, they they kind of overthrew their their big oppressors uh, at, at this time when he was writing in the mid 1800 mid 1800s so but he did say there was still this kind of nearly indentured servitude kind of going on you know so mm. they were still you know yeah you had this big kind of serfdom this kind of lower class basically working the land and again working this mundane task this land this arable land this place it gave rise to a lot of what we would see now as present day melodic Georgian music with the uh, Balalakai, the three stringed uh, kind of guitar they have. Yeah. That uh, a lot of that music <clears throat> centered around those early days of work in the fields. But yeah, no, I, I just thought it was, it, it's one of the, one of the earliest examples of a geographer making a direct link, you know, from a sense mm. of place and where you are and what it can actually do to you culturally, you know. 
Yeah. David Byrne mentions it in his um, his book. He mentions that like why rhythmic music came from Africa is because they were never enclosed. They always played music. They didn't have concrete and stuff like that around them. And it's quite primal and stuff. And a lot of like ancient African cultures always have, it's just rhythm. It's like hitting drums and all this like uh, polyrhythms come from Africa. Usually because when we, the Europeans and stuff like that, were developing their music and different things, it was always enclosed in churches and the reverb for rhythms and stuff sound horrendous inside these big cavernous type places whereas out on the actual land where there is no reflections of stones or anything like that where it's all very open rhythms sound amazing like hitting drums and stuff and that's Mm. obviously why gregorian chant and everything sounds amazing Mm. inside churches and getting those kind of first forms of harmony that like the the drones of chant basically sounds great inside of temples and churches and so like that even if you want to go over to the east and asia they had uh, Buddhist chants and Hindi chants and everything it sounds these long held notes sound amazing inside human structures whereas rhythms don't so a lot of these cultures that had religious structures where they develop music rarely have percussion because it just it doesn't sound good inside there it yeah. sounds better to hold notes and resonate organs all these sorts of things like that's why organs were built into churches and yeah the acoustics of a place has a lot to contribute to the the type of music that develops in a certain place yeah, it's really interesting, actually, when you think about it, when it's so funny that you mentioned Crowded House at the start there, Frank, but um, they recorded an album out in the middle of nowhere, out in Carry Carry Beach. Uh, but it's literally, they turned, they converted beach houses into studios and they lived and recorded and worked on, on these beaches. And uh, Neil Finn said that where they were, the atmosphere, the setting could affect the songwriting. So you'd wake up in the morning and nice calm waves and you'd write a lovely acoustic song and by the end of that day if a thunderstorm rolled in uh, that nice soft acoustic ballad had turned into a a rock song that you were just trashing it out you know what I mean so how where you are the atmosphere can actually affect the songwriting absolutely like there's always the the singer songwriter people who go live in cabins and all that sort of stuff to get more uh, acoustic you know isolation type of things because you you inevitably think when you're not surrounded by stimulation so you do come out with quite introspective sort of music when you go live in isolation mm. um, and also if you live in a city you come out with very uh, human based stuff you know you'll be singing about sex drugs and rock and roll if you're just if that's what you're around if you talk about ethnomusicology with like where music comes from like what myself and ian were talking about what you touched on there Mm. why music comes from a certain area you've always got to look at the crossovers of cultures and when places were colonized and when music got transported which you can literally talk about for hours and it's still being studied to this day and written about i think the quite interesting one is what happens since music that are being recorded is that everybody can use it. i suppose the, the prime example is that of that is the english bands in the 60s and the british invasion were selling american music back to americans because they were the first wave of people displacing music basically because like you know why were led zeppelin and the beatles and the yardbirds and the stones they were all playing music made by black southern people like yeah you know yeah rhythm and blues and suddenly there were english people were playing it and they were almost playing it better because they were obsessing over it because they had these records they could listen to over and over and over again which the blues guys didn't have they were just picking it up as they went along it was their culture mm. And they were kind of advancing, or they were very slowly changing it and evolving it. But the British people were post-war, they had a lot of money, they could buy records, and they were the ones properly studying it. And they were becoming better guitar players because they had more stuff to reference. Not many, like, mm-hmm. Howlin' Wolf didn't know that, unless he lived close to him or met him on the road, he didn't know that Robert Johnson existed. He didn't hear his records. He was just playing and picking up songs off the road, basically. Whereas the English guys had the luxury of having all their records and being able to get like Delta style, Chicago style, New York style, all these different styles and amalgamate them into one and become these like unbelievably good guitar players. And they were selling it back then to Americans when they went over in the invasion. Like, Jesus, these kids are better at playing R&B than we are. And they don't give a shit about, you know, uh, segregation. They're playing white and black music. So it's like this perfect, it's like it's sped up evolution basically because it could be recorded and 
listened to so often and that's basically all music you know like oasis playing rock and roll nirvana you know, all these kind of work and class people now playing music that should have been out of their reach suddenly you know there's guys in track suits playing glam rock yeah. it's a uh, it's weird that uh, it can be so dis- displaced and dislodged like Irish people doing hip hop. It's It seems weird and wrong, but we live in a globalized world now where you can do anything from anywhere. It doesn't matter if you grew up around it. It doesn't matter what your chops are. It doesn't matter if you come from the hood. You can still be a rapper. It doesn't matter if you're from uh, Eastern Mongolia. You can still do throat singing and stuff like that because you can learn it to do it online. You don't have to grow up around it. So that's kind of that's where it's also very interesting of how it's like all kind of globalization. It's like it, it doesn't really matter anymore because it's also globalized and everybody can do it from everywhere. Great record. Excellent album. We learned a lot from Great it. Great record. And welcome back. For this week's album section, I spoke to New York-based artist J.W. Francis about his new album, We Share a Similar Joy, which was released through Sunday Best Recordings on the 7th of November just gone by. Uh, we spoke about everything, about uh, New York's music scene, its current state now with the COVID restrictions and all his influences and everything that went towards making the album. So without further ado, here is J.W. Francis. Well, hey man, how are you? Hey, what up? What's happening? Oh, you know, you know, living in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it's not a, it's not an easy yeah. question nowadays. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a very complicated moment because there's so much hope, especially here in the U.S. with the election with the vaccine and everything, but there's also a knowledge that it's about to be a very scary winter. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of a double edge. The light is at the end of the tunnel, at least. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> it kind of has to be. Congratulations on the album. I absolutely oh, love it. Dude, thanks a lot. Yeah, funny time to... Yeah, I finished the album like a year ago, so... I was kind of sad that I didn't come out with it then when I could do like a big show or something. Yeah. But I was just I was just looking to like, you know, properly release it, find someone who could make some vinyl about it and uh, get it out there because it's just it's you against the world, as you know, with yeah. music when you don't have anybody helping you out. So so yeah, it was funny. And it's funny that it ended up taking it was it, that it ended up being a UK label and um, them being connected. Cause I don't know if you know, I guess Sunday best was started by this guy, Rob DeBank, which is a hilarious name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Who is uh, this, or I'm not sure if he still is or was a BBC DJ, but because of that, it's been getting a, a good amount of airplay on BBC. So my listenership has actually complete, like my top cities used to be New York, LA, Chicago, and now it's uh, London, Manchester, Glasgow. <laughs> and I'm it's like, oh, yeah, it's amazing. I'm like, I got to get over there. Yeah. I got to get over there and play some shows. But, you know, virus willing next year, we can we can pull that off. Yeah. yeah i was gonna ask actually when you have like you lived in paris was it yeah so we moved there when i was 13 my family moved there when i was 13 my mom was like following her dreams we're not french at all although now she's actually naturalized french citizen um but yeah so formative years from like 13 to 19 years old i was in paris i went to french public high school had no choice but to be fluent like just (laughs) <laughs> yeah thrown into the bath water um and it's a cool play obviously it's fucking paris it's mm. great but <laughs> but um but yeah coming at it from a american i was always the american in france and then when i got back to when i got back to america i'd never been to new york but when i moved to new york i was very briefly the frenchie but i was always so american in in france that i I I kind of dropped the French. <laughs> I'm, this is I hope this doesn't make any French listeners angry or whatever. But I'm <laughs> this might be offensive, but I'm way too smiley to be French. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, 
they spot me out in the middle. <laughs> they know exactly I'm not one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I've actually I've been to Paris many, many times. And, yeah, um, yeah. It's one thing I always thought you kind of if you're with a friend and you're kind of laughing and joking on the street or like on the metro, everyone kind of looks yeah. at you as if you're weird. <laughs> yeah, it's a little faux pas almost. Like obviously, like obviously, you can laugh. It's not illegal to laugh and stuff, but especially if you're doing it in English, it's to, they're just like, "Come on, y'all!" Yeah. This is cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you played over there as like yeah. J.W. Francis? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I whenever I, I I started this project in 2018, so when I and I go back for Christmas to be with my family, hopefully I can. Oh. I'm going to make it this year. I just have to, because there's no other option. But mm. um, we play, I play like a yearly Christmas show at Supersonic. Oh, sweet. If you that place. Yeah, it's near the Bastille. If you're ever there, I highly recommend. Whenever shows were a thing, yeah. they did, um, it was free entry before like 10 p.m. So you could just go there, hang out until the band started and you get a free show, which was always awesome. Um, That's really but yeah. Cool. And whenever I'm over there, I obviously can't afford to bring to fly four other people with me to play a show. So my dad plays drums, so he'll he'll play drums with uh, he'll play drums for the band uh, when I'm over there, which is special. <laughs> That's really cool because I've heard people. Yeah. Uh, like one of the coolest things I've always thought is when uh, artists like yourself, when you come to Europe or somewhere you'll have a band, like a European band, you'll have a... Exactly. And that's what I've done in the past. I actually played, when I was there, I was there last fall because my day job brought me there. And they don't know that I am a musician. And so <laughs> I, every single weekend, I went to a different place and uh, just sometimes would have to play sick on a Friday or a Monday but and I, on on the internet, I called it like a European tour. But really, I was just like taking my weekends like where wherever. And, and yeah, it's so much fun. I mean, honestly, for most most people can't really imagine the stress. Or like, I, I mean, they are like wouldn't be able to handle the stress of like finding a local band, you know, coordinating with them, making sure that. You know, having one rehearsal day of, if you're lucky, normally the rehearsal is sound check. And <laughs> especially with solo projects, because when a solo, a solo project kind of implies that you're a control freak and you can't really work with other people very well. <laughs> but um, but that's not really my mentality at all. It's just kind of like, yes, like <laughs> whatever this sounds like, it's going to be what they get. <laughs> that's like so do you contact the people before you go so i usually the way i usually do is i'll just put out a call on instagram uh, that's usually where i find people and i'll just say like do you guys does anybody know any drummers in this town or basis or whatever the lead guitar the lead guitar is always the hardest It'll, that's mm -hmm. why i usually put out a call like a month or a month and a half in advance and um and uh yeah i'll just send them the t and i'll just send them the tab and and every honestly every time it's been a fan which has been really 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 nice not like just complete hired gun rando hmm. uh, it's been someone who like already knows the music which is that's really special and um and yeah it's just a good time and then they bring out their friends who are coming to see them play and it's just like it's just kind of benefits everybody and so far it hasn't been a disaster <laughs> like it could be a disaster yeah that, but, that's amazing though because it must be so cool to hear someone else's style playing your own stuff because like, exactly totally yeah. sometimes it'll be like a hard rock kind of set and sometimes it'll be more of a jazzy kind of set like yeah i remember this guy played i have a song called the when the train goes by mm. and this guy I got a keyboard player and he was just like Vince Guaraldi on that thing. Just like, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I was like, that's not what people are going to are expecting, but I'm down for it. I'm like, I'm yeah, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> that's really cool. See, I, I'd love that. Like I'd love yeah. to yeah, like, come see yeah. someone that I'm familiar with. And then you get to the show and it's just like, yeah, this crazy yeah. type of band behind you. 
exactly yeah and i always then that's the thing is like it doesn't matter if we mess up because pretty quickly people understand that the vibe is just like having fun with a live show i'm not trying to recreate the album i'm not trying and I, i'm really impressed when bands do do that like you get a band like i've seen like beach house and like beach house is like a phenomenal live act and they sound exactly like the record and yeah. it's you're immersed in the space and they have the light show and it's amazing but if one of them played a wrong note it'd be like <gasps> everybody'd be like oh my god but like i'm playing wrong notes all over the place but yeah. it's just it's just a good time <laughs> yeah. you know and it's, it's, you play everything on your recordings yeah that's you doing all every, the instruments everything but the drums and the and the percussion and stuff on that first ep with like joe fusco and stuff that was all me and then sahil just my friend slash producer just mixed it all and then the next record he was the, well this one that just came out he was like why don't we do it together? Cause I can make it sound good. <laughs> and so I was like, let's, let's do it. And yeah, he's just, in the beginning I was, I was, I started with doing the drums. He was like, do you mind if I, cause he's like a real drummer. And I was like, well, yeah, why don't you take a shot? And then I was like, okay, you're doing the drums. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how that's gone. <laughs> that's amazing. Like, like, it's being able to play everything yourself is pretty cool but when you have someone who really knows their way around an instrument you're like yeah actually this you're like actually it. yeah because i'm not because i'm not too married to the whole myth of like one man doing everything like someone puts on tame impala and someone's like you know it's all one guy like it's mm -hmm. like that's cool but i'm not i don't i don't really care enough to to do that also like I think that I think there's just a lot of merit to, to giving up control where you can, you know, like, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's going to make something more interesting, not to, sh and then the, this will bring me to, so the, the guy I obviously get compared to a lot is Mac DeMarco, because I wear a hat and have, <laughs> a, have a, <laughs> a jizzy jazzy guitar or whatever. Um, but like, he's an artist, not to, throw shade or anything but he's an artist who like you know does everything himself engineers produces does all the instruments and like i think it was good for a while but it's almost become to a fault on the last couple records in my opinion it's just kind of gotten to this point where it's like boring kind of <laughs> or like sending in chillness that is like too chill. it's just boring chill at this point yeah. I'd 100% I, agree with that. Yeah. 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 It's like if someone else was producing his stuff, it might like it, it could, he could really benefit. And I think he's actually kind of woken up to that idea because the last couple of months he's come out with like four or five collabs with other people. And I think that's, those are sounding like a lot more fresh, like, mm. but yeah, better groove. <laughs> I think, yeah. as you said, like the comparison people saying that it's like, mm -hmm. It's kind of a devil he was like kind of the beatles of the internet era sort of thing so if you're if you're anyway slightly like him everyone's gonna go oh you're like him it's like oh, have you actually yeah. listened to it it's not really <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. And, and everybody is somebody when they start it's always like that the arctic monkeys were the strokes and the stroke were the ramones and well, like everybody is like everyone's gonna say someone is directly ripping off somebody mm. and then you just got to wait for the second album. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's actually quite funny. I, uh, me and the guys, the other guys that do this with me, uh, yeah. the other guys in the band, we kind of went down a rabbit hole of listening to or Stevie Moore. Oh my God. Love him. Yeah. yeah. Love, that's a good rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. And when you listen yeah. to him, you go, oh, geez, well, Mac, everyone's, everyone's just ripping him off then. Aren't they? <laughs> yeah. You're like, wait a minute. Like, yeah. Ariel Pink is ripping off our stevie moore and mac to is ripping off ariel pink and it's just yeah it's yeah. it's a big off they like <laughs> that's why you just don't even listen to that stuff you're like whatever yeah, exactly everyone sounds like so it's, it's influence like <laughs> yeah it's just the way it works like we all breathe the same way <laughs> like you were gonna <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna have similar stuff going exactly <laughs> um with like 
like you've lived in Paris, New York, and you're from Oklahoma as well, yeah? Yeah, that's right. All my, we're originally from Oklahoma. So how much do you think, like, especially like you have a song called New York, like how much does where yeah. you are influence what you're doing? Oh, uh, 100%. I mean, I'm I'm really someone who tries to be totally present or like, you know, I love to just kind of fully immerse myself in my surroundings and uh, and absorb it. And I'm also a little obsessive. Like, I just like to know things about what I'm looking at or where I'm standing or whatever. I'm a tour guide of New York. So not, that's not my, that's a kind of a side gig, but yeah. it's, it's a license I got. <laughs> and, nice. and just that it kind of puts you when you've given tours and even afterwards, it kind of puts you in a mentality of like, of the knowledge that there's just so much history, wherever you're standing, a lot of things have happened there. And that, just kind of blew open my mind and i was like wow there's there's just you can really and you can really like make micro history of like oh my god like all the i'm just gonna look at all the bricks of this place and like try and tell the story of where all the bricks came from or like the manholes or the cement or all these things have stories and so definitely when i'm writing songs i'm just like in the place where i'm at <laughs> that makes sense mm. uh, and um i'd say i'd say definitely place has a huge part of it but people is probably bigger for me like a lot of my songs are about specific people or about relationships with people um but yeah it's it's been a funny ride i feel like just coming from a small town in oklahoma it's i Honestly, probably if I was going to give, if I was going to have a kid, I would probably raise them outside of the city and then bring them to the city as much as of a city person I am now, just because I got the experience of growing up in a small town and then being brought to Paris as like a teenager and just being like, oh my God, you can walk to a store to get milk? Like Forever, you know, and that's just mind blowing, and like that the world is walkable and, <laughs> <laughs> and like there. So, so yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely, place has had a big influence. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a really good factor of what you're saying about like. I think it is definitely better to probably start in the country and then see cities and just have your mind blown exactly exactly because i feel i feel honestly i feel bad for the people who grew up here in new york which i hate to say because most of my like my best friend grew up in the city here but they won't they will they are robbed of that experience of of coming to the city with the wide eyes and whatever and like the reverse is kind of scary going to the country <laughs> from the city you're yeah. like oh it's all spooky and people are backwards and <laughs> You don't it doesn't typically happen for a reason um but yeah i just i feel bad that they don't get that they don't get that experience of of being in awe yeah you know yeah i try, try being from ireland where you know everything <laughs> everything is still a bit slightly behind so when you go to like you go to paris or you go to somewhere in america it's like wow the new wow. world <laughs> <laughs> the new world <laughs> I, I make it sound like proper yeah uh, shepherd still but yeah it's <laughs> there's a few things just like when you got to see like you see double decker buses and stuff you're like wow they don't have these at home <laughs> <laughs> no they don't have them here either <laughs> <laughs> that's true actually yeah america doesn't really yeah. have double deckers we don't and it's weird i'm like why don't we because it seems like such a good idea like so many more people can right in the bus yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> like i wonder. like i don't know why they just don't have them everywhere it's yeah anyway <laughs> um yeah speaking of new york are you mainly based around brooklyn yeah well it's funny because when i wrote this everyone always thought that because of the hat and the glasses and the beard but um but uh when i wrote this album i was living in harlem and that's where i was living with joe fusco my best friend <clears throat> um it was when i came to paris for work that i gave up my apartment and then and i did that little fake european tour 
then when I went back to New York, I was like, you know what? Everybody already thinks I live in Brooklyn. Why don't I just why don't I just bite the ball and finally move out there and <laughs> find it? And it's honestly, I I freaking love it. I I fully just the only thing I don't have that's the only cliche box that I don't take is that I don't ride a bike, which mm. I probably should, but I'm honestly just afraid of wheels. <laughs> <laughs> But I've got well, I've got a little backyard. I garden. You know, I make my cold brew. I like. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. It's, it's a it's a nice domestic life. Yeah, yeah. Like from the outside looking in, basically, mm. as you said, you think music in uh, New York. You think Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it as like thriving as we all think? For looking in uh yeah i would say so i mean right now it's kind of hard to say you know just because i can't see people and whatnot um (laughs) or like go to a spot and hang out Mm. i feel like it's going to come back and i feel like next year people are just going to be like only like living at music venues though because of how (laughs) starved we've been yeah but yeah there it's so it's so it's so crazy because there's about like people say like what's the scene like in new york and you're like which one there's like eight thousand scenes <laughs> like it's insane just the amount of um i mean it's not like you know new orleans or somewhere where there's such a live music culture that you walk down one block and there are i walked down a block in new orleans one time and there were 10 live bands <laughs> on the block. four on each four in little bars on each side and two on opposite ends of the street playing street being street musicians and i was like wow this is it's not the same in new york you don't have that but you do have plenty of venues and that's honestly what i'm really worried about one of the things i'm really worried about in a post-covid world is how many of those made it through this long winter you know there's yeah. not really a good i know i know i don't know if um if there's some kind of like save our stages initiative in Ireland, but there has not been in the U S like, there's no, there's no federal federal response to this in terms of saving the entertainment industry. So really, yeah, which has been really bad. I mean, um, Amy Klobuchar, funnily enough, um, entered, tried to introduce a bill. I don't think it passed though about like, and he, but even if it did, I'm, I'm pretty sure when I looked at that, that wasn't really for like the small independent venues. It was more for the Bowery venues and stuff. Um, so, yeah, no, there's not really. That's the thing is like America's government. Unlike I mean, I, I, I've hosted bands who like got grants from the government to get plane tickets to come to New York to play shows. The same thing with Canada. I know I know a lot of bands who've gotten grants from the government. There's just no kind of infrastructure like that here in the U.S. because they just know that people are going to do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't really have to throw any money because there's so many people just trying to make it here. So, which kind of makes it a rough environment for <laughs> surviving. But Yeah, absolutely. Because as I said, from the outside looking in, you just see all these bands come from New York or Brooklyn or... Yeah. Seattle or whatever city it is that you see everybody coming from mm. and you kind of think oh well, that place must be thriving it must be a great place to go be a musician but it's 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 all DIY isn't it yeah it's all DIY yeah I mean it's either DIY or you know there's kids with rich parents um <laughs> which, which you know that sucks for the rest of us who are like wow it's possible and then you're like wait a minute they are getting an allowance from their parents yeah. and it's not a reasonable dream if you don't have <laughs> a independent wealth which i'm like oh, gosh i don't would never never even want that i would never if i yeah if my parents were independently wealthy i think i wouldn't do the arts just to not give anybody any delusions <laughs> 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 But, um, but no, I mean, a lot of people, especially during this time when the city has, rem- the rents have gone down a bit because of all of this, but, um, a lot of people have moved because the reason we're in New York is to meet up with people and play shows and meet people and you can't do that now. So, 
a lot of people are going to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is only like two and a half hours away. Um, and they've really, they, I mean, like talk about thriving DIY scenes. They've got like threat, like complete apartments that are just bands living together kind of deal. Like a different, a different, more punk <laughs> nice. uh, thing going on. Yeah. I mean, I've even been like, should I just go to Philly? But <laughs> 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 yeah that's the weird thing about music you've got to chase at places <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah stay alive but uh yeah with your new listenership when we get the green light please uh swing by ireland on the way oh of course man I've, yeah i've actually had a couple people in dublin be like hey come on down <laughs> I'm like yeah well, i would love to yeah, <laughs> <I> can. <laughs> yeah we're trying to we're trying to spread the word about you as much as we can here just to hey. and like i haven't heard anybody saying that they disliked it or anything like it has oh, it's great been, it's been rave reviews so you'll oh, definitely, you'll definitely have a crowd <laughs> yeah. i'm about to put out something kind of controversial actually which I've, <laughs> i started, i started do you ever use submit hub for your own stuff that's Did actually you? how i found you Oh no way! Yeah. Oh cool! Yeah, yeah. So I started. So I um, I'm coming out with a surprise on Friday. It's a Christmas EP, yes. and <laughs> which I'm excited about. Like I've been thinking about Christmas since March, honestly. Um, and I recorded in July, and so it's a really funny. I I I love it, and because I, I love Christmas and whatnot. But, but I've been submitting it to all these places, and I've like only gotten rejections because, <laughs> because one people are either like you know we're an indie blog we don't cover christmas stuff like christmas is not cool kind of deal mm. um, <laughs> or they're like uh it's just way too early for Chris. it's not even <laughs> december yet and i'm like but the people need this now you know i mean i i i a little bit agree in america it's like against the law to listen to christmas music before thanksgiving um but the the label being british they were like you know no christmas starts in the uk on the november 1st <laughs> like it's on the radio already you got to get going so so we'll see now I'm, now i'm just a little nervous everyone's gonna be like oh christmas is lame or <laughs> <laughs> or it's boo it's too early yeah. but we'll see we'll see no Matt, that that's just made my day i actually i spent a while on spotify <laughs> compiling a christmas playlist oh great okay well, and you'll have... if you could provide me some songs to that i'd be chuffed i got you <laughs> i i got you Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully you're like, oh, fuck, this is lame. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, it's coming out on Friday or you're just announcing it on Friday? Coming out on Friday, yeah, no, it's, it's I'm just going to drop it. And, I, and that's the other thing is I wanted to do a release just because this album was like, I dropped the first single a year ago from it. And like, I've just been releasing it so slowly, like a single every like eight weeks that... I was just like, I just, I just want to drop something. I just want to like, pff, like, instead of being like, Hey guys, I've got something to say. Mm -hmm. And that is that I will have something to say next week. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, I just hate the build up. I'm like, just give it this. <laughs> yeah. I think that'd be amazing, man. Uh, with your style and just, yeah, I'm the same. I'm a sucker for Christmas. So I'm a sucker for Christmas. Yeah. That's the thing is a sucker for Christmas. I'll, but, I'll absolutely yeah. be, uh, rep have it on repeat in the build up <laughs> excellent <laughs> i think i think if there's a year we need christmas it's this year as well so that's what i'm saying that's what i that's that, that was my sentiment i was like come on y'all we need this <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think it's gonna be great man i think you're gonna you're gonna yeah. lift the lid on everyone else is gonna be trying to do it now <laughs> fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Yeah, i did it first i did christmas first <laughs> i think dolly parton actually already released her christmas album so that gave me some hope i was like if dolly parton's doing it i yeah. can do it <laughs> next year collaboration yeah can you imagine <laughs> yeah, she actually put a million dollars towards the moderna vaccine i heard she something about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's just like of course dolly pardon just saving the world yeah. like, <laughs> she, she's gotten to that point so yeah yeah <laughs> i'm surprised bono didn't have more to do with it <laughs> yeah he's, he's strangely keeping quiet at this time yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Like maybe he's going to come out with his own vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> that that comes free with the next uh, YouTube album. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The only once you get the vaccine, you have YouTube's new album stuck in your head. <laughs> a trial period of thirty days. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Genuinely, we have a, a section on this that we call a uh, fight or pint. Fight or pint, I love it. Yeah. yeah. So you know, a pint, like twenty yeah. twenty ounces of beer. Right. Uh, right. And basically, I give you two names, and okay. you say which one of these guys you'd like to go for a drink with and like have a crazy night out with, or one of them you'd probably end up getting into a fight with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've picked two new yorkers just to, to keep the theme oh going. good okay the two names i gotta throw at you are julian casablancas and eddie murphy <laughs> <laughs> honestly i mean that's it's really easy for me both i would definitely pint it up with both of them um <laughs> yeah they're, i mean come on they're both they're both eddie murphy's the most hilarious man on earth and julian casablancas is a is an amazing songwriter, but I've honestly been like very. <laughs> Maybe he would fight me for this, but I've been super underwhelmed with like his level of charisma, or like I don't know how to say, I don't know how to say it nicely. <laughs> but like he just seems like a really weird, awkward dude. Actually, I, I always thought like he was like a cool rock star. Like you know, growing up, just watching those you know videos in the early 2000s i was like man it's so cool and the leather jackets and now he's just got such strange greasy hair and he's like i don't know uh, i would also tell him i'd also be like what the f-? i mean you know it's cool but he just came out with he just did this he just did this instagram post being like i didn't vote for anybody but you know we're gonna march on washington if trump doesn't uh like step down or whatever and like i totally respect your wish not to vote like that's totally fine but with someone with such a big platform just admitting that he mm. didn't vote in the most important election it's just like not cool dude like <laughs> i mean but yeah he's cool he's cool <laughs> yeah, right. i'm satisfied with those answers <laughs> excellent <laughs> sweet man uh as well we'd always ask people if they have uh any music recommendations so if you've got a uh... oh, absolutely for this time of you know anxiety and and staying inside i think it's really important to find a sense of inner peace and serenity because you're gonna have to be with yourself <laughs> for a few more weeks at least well a few more months more realistically but mm. Um, so there's a great album by this guy Laraji, if you don't know him. He's mostly ambient music and actually has an incredible story. He was playing in Washington Square Park. He was like playing this instrument that he had kind of modified to be his own. And Brian Eno walked up and was like, I want to make an album with you. <laughs> and <laughs> actually like actually like left him a note because Laraji was so into his music that he didn't look up or like whatever. So he like left him a note just like with his phone number on it. And they made an album together and that just kind of made Laraji's career. But he's so much more than just a man. <laughs> like he's just like, he's, he's a very interesting guy. And he's got one album that's um, unlike any other one where he sings a lot. He doesn't usually sing at all but it's called Vision Songs Volume 1. And that's a great, it's just a great, I love listening to it. It's so quirky and homemade and it's just him on a tape player basically improvising and going at it. But um, it's beautiful. It's a really beautiful. I put it on while I cook and while I do uh, household things. <laughs> uh, no, I'll absolutely, absolutely check him out. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, just before I let you go, uh, everyone can listen to you on Spotify, JW Francis, Bandcamp, all these places. But where is the easiest place to buy the record? The easiest place to buy the record is Bandcamp for sure. And I think they're still doing them on, I think they still do Bandcamp Fridays every Friday. So if you don't need it by Christmas, because I think they take a little bit to ship out. Um, if you don't need it by Christmas, then for the sake of my bank account, it would be awesome if you waited until Friday. 
of the month, first Friday of the month. But if you need it before Christmas, definitely get it before then. And it's really not that much of a difference. But so yeah, Bandcamp. So uh, I think there's still yellow ones. The yellow, the the yellow is really cool. I'm I'm happy that they that they made it like that. I was they were like, do you want any special color? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm a sucker sucker for colors too. <laughs> yeah, it just looks so cool. You know, <laughs> like. Yeah, I think we're good to uh, close it up there. Cool. Well, thanks for having me, dude. It's super fun, and yeah, I'll I'll let you know as soon as I make it over there, man, to yeah. Ireland. You let, let you let me know if you come to New York. Absolutely, yeah. Go on. See you. Yeah, you too, man. Enjoy your day. You too, man. See ya. Tired of that off-white smile? Can't get that new job, promotion, or someone special? Then look no further than Fitzsimmons Dental Clinic. Hi, Dr. Michael Fitzsimmons here, and we have a very exciting new product for you that will unlock that pearly smile. No, it is not fluoride, nor is it bleach, and it is certainly not laser therapy. It is soot. Yes, you heard me correctly. Soot. Straight from the Irish co-op of fireplaces of Midlands Island. We have that spokesperson, Tony McLaughlin here. Tony, please explain to us how soot can help you have that pearly white smile. Well, I'm sure you're all back in the emergency now. Uh, we have none of that fancy tool baits around like that, so, you know, we just, um, we just used the salt uh, in the in the fireplace and sure, God, it was great and pearly white and strong teeth. You know, sure, it's great. It, it, it saves money as well, you know. Fantastic. There you have it. Soot. Verified by countless generations in the midlands of Ireland and elsewhere and now bringing it to you at Simmons Dental Clinic unlock that pearly white smile and we're back with another installment of Fight or Pint this week we're going by region so um, I'm going to start with uh, you Frank and I'm going to give you um, the choice of picking either Manchester, London, LA, or New York. I've never been to Manchester. I've never been to any of those places. I've been to London, so I've been to London. Give me London because I've been there. Okay, so London is. Um, I went with the girls on this one. Okay, so we're gonna go with. Oh, <laughs> God, yeah, this is an um, elephant room. Go down and in for me. Uh, no, no, no. It, all right, your choice of names are Amy Winehouse. Or oh. Florence Florence Welch from Florence and the Machine. I've got to be PC here and just choose the one that I prefer. So I'm going to say Amy Winehouse, I definitely prefer. So I'd rather spend some time getting along with her and having a drink and having been in good spirits than Florence, I'd arm wrestle. Yeah, well, she'd have the, the machine to back her up as well. Like so, Game, game of Tiddlywinks. Well, if the whole lot of the machine are there, there's like 13 of them. That's That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy Winehouse. Uh, she once heckled Bono at the Q Music Awards. So while he was giving an acceptance speech, she reportedly shouted, "Shut up! I don't give a fuck." <laughs> so I like. I really like that. Um, she wrote. That's why you're going for a pint with her. Yeah, she wrote her <laughs> song "Rehab" as a joke. Um, she she sung the hook whilst uh, walking around Soho with Mark Ronson, and he turns around and asks her whose song is that and she was like no I just kind of made it up there and they headed straight to the studio to record the song and finish the song that day Florence Welch fun fact about her is in an interview she revealed that she's been suffering from dyslexia anxiety and dyspraxia uh, from a young age so she decided to channel her frustrations into songs uh, focusing on her musical career so that's what drove her to write and record music so I thought that was quite interesting how could you fight these people, Frank? Yeah, <laughs> like you give me Florence Welch, who's, who's who's overcome all this adversity to be who she is, Do you, and Amy Winehouse, who suffered a horrible end, and you make you. I said, <laughs> I said it <laughs> into saying I want to fight one of them. I think it's funny that you always picked. I the had my fun. That that always is going to get you in more trouble. Um, Ian, so uh, fight or pint by region. So first of all, your region. What to left is Manchester, L.A. or New York. Ooh, where do you um, want to go? I have never been to any of those three, so mm-hmm. uh, I'll go with the Big Apple, New York. 
New York. Okay, so your first one is the Beastie Boys, and your second oh, one is Wu Tang Clan. So fight or pint. Uh, well. <laughs> Ian <laughs> hanging out with either of these guys is <laughs> well I, I definitely had a lot of time for uh, Beastie Boys back in the day um, some really nice tracks uh, yeah I'd, 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 I'd like to have a few pints with them alright but you're uh, going to fight you're going to fight the, the Wu-Tang Clan <laughs> yeah I mean I probably wouldn't survive but yeah <laughs> Fun facts, um, we'll start with your uh, Beastie Boys because you're going for a pint with them. So Beastie stands for Boys Entertaining Anarchistic States Towards Internal Excellence. They, their first kind of big shows, which I think this is bizarre, but the Beastie Boys opened for Madonna during her 1985 The Virgin Tour. Imagine going to see that, that gig. Just the Beastie <laughs> Boys followed by Madonna. And imagine being into all of it. People so, would have been. Like that now that sounds weird. No, but in no. the eighties Madonna was like punk. It's like she had a lot of respect from like the likes of Sonic Youth and Nirvana and people like that. You're 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 fighting the Wu Tang clan and you know it's not gonna be an easy feat because oh. one here's one unknown fact about the Wu Tang clan is many of the Wu are vegan or vegetarian. So they could just <laughs> eat chips all day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and jellies. That, 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 that was like a few weeks back, Frank, remember? You had nothing, you literally had nothing but chips that whole day. Yeah, I had a, f- <laughs> a full day there a while back uh, before we went into the studio. I met up with Ian and I'd just been eating chips all day. And not even good chips. They were like reduced to clear Centra chips. What I also found interesting... Um, as, a, as I was researching these extensively, was um, the Jizza, uh, nicknamed the genius, really is a genius and is, is well-versed in quantum physics. And he's even worked with physicists to comb out any inaccuracies or inconsistencies in his science-inspired music. Uh, he's been fascinated with physics as a child, and he's passionately pursued his interests into adulthood. Uh, in 2010, he spoke at Harvard University and since has visited other institutions and met with high-profile scientists, even doing his own TED Talk on the topic. So that was your uh, fighter point by region. Did you enjoy yourselves? Um, I, I definitely didn't hate it. Okay, good. That's it the... was um, a trip around the world. Come on down to Sexy Sheila's Sex Shop, where we're having our end of year sale. We carry the largest selection of dillos and vibrators and Munster. Into a bit of slap and tickle? Who is it? We got loose, laundry, handcuffs, restraints, blindfolds, masks, butt plugs. You betcha. We're just off the Kinsale Road roundabout. Open all hours. Come on down to Sexy, Sexy Sheila's Sex Shop. The Elephant Room recommends. Okay, guys. So, what have you got to recommend for the people this week? Ian, you can go first. I'm going to recommend the genius that is or Stevie Moore. He is affectionately known as the godfather of DIY lo-fi music. He started off in the 70s, started recording home recordings. Now, it's not just, you know, a basic little tape desk and, and just, you know, uh, go off and record some lo-fi stuff. He actually had a proper home studio um, that was just an absolute phenomenal output. Like, he, I think he recorded something like over 400 albums throughout his life. But he's a very, he's an unbelievably accomplished musician. Uh, he's multi instrumentalist. He did have a very, very brief career at the start in the kind of late sixties, early seventies as a session musician. So his dad was actually an incredibly famous session musician in Nashville. He played with the likes of Elvis Presley in that. Anyway, or Stevie Moore, he tried his hand at a uh, session stuff and he just he absolutely hated the whole thing. You know, he, he really hated the approach of session work. Yeah, he literally retreated back into the basement of his home and created his own studio there and um if i was to recommend an album probably uh, his 1976 work phonography um that's kind of like his first major release um which is uh yeah it's just it, the songwriting is just phenomenal i think um i was speaking about it earlier there with uh jw francis definitely like a precursor to 
Ariel Pink who worked with them, Mac DeMarco, yeah. even even Jonathan Richmond, like it, it's before he came along. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, when you say Godfather of bedroom pop or lo-fi, yeah, it's absolutely. Shane, what juicy morsels have you got for us? Um, just to be slightly different, uh, this week I'm recommending um, The Defiant Ones on Netflix. So mm. it's a series I started watching and it's it just basically follows um, Jimmy Iovine, who uh, was a music producer and he recorded like likes of Tom Petty, um, Fleetwood Mac, <clears throat> um, Bruce uh, Springsteen. And um, it follows him and Dr. Dre and they're both kind of rises in the music industry. How they initially it's them apart and their respective music careers and it's kind of working towards them working together. But it's just really interesting from a point of view, just want a good insight on how the music industry actually works and how what a producer actually does. And like what I found really interesting is how even for the guys in the hip hop world, how they could make it, you know, from the outside, you've made it, you've got a record deal and you're on MTV with a music video and be penniless. There's a facade to everything that we see, you know, obviously in the music industry. It's really interesting and it's just found it really um, cool and in depth, like where I'm at now, he's just discovered Eminem. So that's really cool. Just seeing like a young Eminem working in a studio and, that's another thing you see a lot of the work ethic that goes into like people just literally working 24 hours a day to try make something of themselves so highly recommend it just really interesting yeah no i definitely recommend watching that mm. my recommendation this week is uh irish band uh easy tide they're from navin and they have just like a prolific amount of work up on spotify their last album cigarettes in 2017 is just unbelievable start to finish. They record everything themselves in um, their own studio called Fenor Lane, just outside uh, Slane, in between Slane and Navin. But yeah, it has a real signature character to it that only comes from when you record yourself without going into someone else's space and record in their studio. They do it all at home. So they get this real signature kind of dirty sound there. Uh, similar to bands like the the OCs, massive distortion sounds, big bass sounds. But as well, like their songwriting is really flawless. They have really catchy choruses, good lyrics. And they're Irish. They're they're one of those not talked about, genuinely good Irish bands that are very hard to come across in Ireland because most of the stuff that gets talked about is, let's face it, shite. It's overhyped and not good. These are one of these unhyped Irish bands that everybody should be listening to, only they're not uh, there isn't the right uh, there isn't the right nepotism to get the uh, heard and seen but yeah they're constantly releasing singles and albums and all DIY and all doing it themselves so get out there and listen to them yeah so that's all I recommend are we good to finish up there guys yeah I'm cool with that cool thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week where we'll have more guests and more trivia and thanks to you later. W. Francis for being on absolutely Fair play.